Hi, uh, I'm Jonathan Golden, partner at NEA. And I'm here today to talk about four questions that every marketplace should be able to answer. I wrote about this in a Medium post a couple of years ago and wanted to share my thoughts in presentation format today. So first, who am I? Uh, I am a partner at NEA, which is a global venture capital firm based here in San Francisco and Palo Alto. And I invest in consumer and enterprise software. Previously, I was director of product at Airbnb, uh, similar to uh, Lenny, who spoke a couple sessions ago, who was also in product with me during a good amount of my time at Airbnb. I helped scale Airbnb over 100x uh, in six years. Uh, I gave a talk around scaling Airbnb 100x six years at the Marketplace Conference two years ago. So you can go back and take a look at that if you'd like. And prior to Airbnb, worked in product at both Dropbox and HubSpot. Before that was a venture investor at Greylock Partners. So first, marketplaces are messy. After all, you're dealing with an ecosystem of participants, buyers, and sellers that are constantly in flux. Their needs and desires change over time. Not every marketplace succeeds. For every Airbnb, there's a home swapping marketplace that didn't get to liquidity. For every Uber, there's an on-demand marketplace that couldn't get the economics to work. These success stories have overcome many obstacles largely because they leveraged key elements within the marketplace to create lightning in a bottle. And I'd like to talk about these key elements today. Oh, there we go. Uh, so the four key factors that we're gonna talk about today are network effects, uh, type of supply, two-sided incentives, and the size and the frequency of interaction. Now, these may seem like mundane uh, topics uh, that you're familiar with, but really it's in the nuance of these topics where uh, I think it really makes a difference between a marketplace that is just okay versus one that can really endure and build a, a, a thriving mini economy. So when does a marketplace uh, make sense? First, it's probably worth going again over the definition of what a marketplace is. A marketplace is a place simplistically where buyers and sellers meet to conduct commerce. Uh, and I would add uh, in the online world, that is where they handle the payment transaction as well. Uh, marketplaces have inherent benefits that are like uh, those of other types of businesses. The positives are that they have low cost of capital, as I'm sure you're aware, that allows them to scale uh, very, very rapidly if they get things right. Uh, the market also self-corrects. Self uh, it, it works like a mini economy in that uh, both buyers and sellers go in and out of the marketplace um, as, um, as liquidity and needs are met and, and potentially unmet. The negatives, uh, probably one of the, the biggest negatives or maybe the most important negative, is it's really hard to start a marketplace due to the onboarding of initial supply. So you've got to get that supply there, but then it's waiting for demand. Um, the other a big negative of a marketplace is maintaining quality of inventory. You don't have as much control over that inventory. So inventory can go away. Uh, it can misbehave. Um, uh, it can try to take the transaction offline, which we'll talk about uh, in a few more slides. Really want to highlight that you might be able to create a better demand experience by controlling and owning the supply instead of providing a platform that is a marketplace. And I really want um, uh, individuals and founders to really think about that because though marketplaces have many inherent benefits, if the product ultimately isn't, product experience ultimately isn't enhanced for the demand side because of a marketplace, then maybe it makes sense to build more of a traditional type business. Uh, so the first factor are network effects. Uh, and again, um, there's nuance in the type of network effects each marketplace has. So all marketplaces exhibit forms of network effects. It's where each Additional user on either the demand side or the supply side enhances the utility of the network for other users. There's two core types of network effects for marketplaces. There's global network effects that where businesses tend to grow more organically. And commonly, those, those marketplaces allow anybody to uh, build supply in the marketplace in a lot of different geographies and potentially a lot of different verticals. There's also root density network effect businesses that tend to grow supply in more concentrated ways. Uh, it's best if the product is restricted in each market by a specific geography or vertical and, and, and limited. So let's go into these a little bit more. Uh, so global network effects are, are really uh, epitomized by 
the company that I worked for, which is, which is Airbnb. And I get excited about Airbnb because it is inherently a global network effects business. People ask, well, what do you mean? Well, basically anytime a listing uh, or a host places a listing on the platform, anybody in the world can book that listing. And anybody in the world potentially wants to book that listing because Airbnb is in the business of travel and hospitality and uh, accommodation. And that is a global business. And the majority of Airbnb's business pre-pandemic has been international travel. And so Airbnb exhibits these global network effects where once they are established, it's very, very hard to, to disintermediate them. A DoorDash is a great example of a root density network effects business where basically if you add a pizza parlor in San Francisco on the supply side, it's probably not gonna help a hungry person in Sydney, Australia who wants to order pizza. And so for DoorDash, uh, it's, very, it's best for them to build these markets uh, and their network, network effects one by one, geography by geography. People like to debate with Uber if it's a global network effects business or a root density network effects business. I would kind of put them a little bit more in the middle. I think inherently Uber is a root density network effects business. When you want a driver, it's in a specific geography. And, um, and you call upon, when you use the app, you're calling upon only drivers in a specific geography. What's unique about Uber is that Uber is also in uh, the category of transportation. And transportation is inherently also uh, global in nature. And so you actually do see a larger percentage of Uber's tr uh, transactions slightly resemble global network effects than you would something like a DoorDash. Not as much as a business like Airbnb, but somewhere a little bit in between. And that's again because of the category that it's in. With network effects also comes this concept of minimum viable supply liquidity. Uh, and a simple way to, for me to articulate this is when the demand experience is sufficient that a transaction is likely to occur. And so when can you potentially start to achieve some types of network effects in these businesses? Again, you're gonna see me use Airbnb as Uber and, and Uber as examples a lot in this presentation because though they may seem very similar on the surface, they're also very different in terms of how they work. Uh, Airbnb uh, really got a, a form of uh, a lot of growth in the form of network effects when uh, in a specific market, there were roughly 300 listings with 100 reviewed. And the reason why this mattered is because this was a number of listings in a specific geography, at which point the guest and the demand experience was sufficient that when they search for an accommodation for a specific time window, they on average had a few listings to pick from that were reviewed. And that seemed to be around 300 listings and 100 reviewed. And what we noticed is that that was when things really took off in a market where the flywheel really started to, to begin. For Uber, it would be a, a different metric completely. It would be around lead time. Now, I didn't work at Uber, and so I don't know the specific number of minutes that it took for a lead time to get low enough that the flywheel really started to kick off. But my guess is it was anywhere from, call it four to eight minutes, where this is the point at which a passenger could reliably open up the app and uh, get a driver to, to come to them in a, in, a, in a small window of time. It became habitual and predictable. It probably didn't matter as much to get from four minutes down to two minutes, but it probably made a big difference to get from 20 minutes down to maybe call it six minutes. And so this to me is a form of minimum viable supply liquidity where things can really get going. For every marketplace, this number is going to be a different metric uh, and, um, uh, and, and it's going to look different for, for every, every marketplace. But the key is to really focus on the, the demand experience. And it's really when the demand experience becomes compelling and, um, and unique and, uh, and, and, and a high quality. So factor number two is types of supply. And again, this may seem generic, which is, is it a heterogeneous supply marketplace or a homogeneous supply marketplace? But again, there's, there, there's key fundamentals between the two. Airbnb is a great example of a heterogeneous marketplace where all the assets on the marketplace are slightly different. Uh, and Uber is a great example of a homogeneous marketplace where the assets on the platform are roughly the same. They're roughly interchangeable. Where one car or one driver 
it's pretty much the same as the other driver or car and you really don't care that much because it's gonna get you where you need to go. So on the heterogeneous supply, heterogeneous supply can create competitive modes. It's hard to replicate that supply once you have it because it's heterogeneous and somebody else can't just spin it up really, really fast. But on the flip side, it increases the cognitive load on the demand side. And, and, and what that creates is what I call a search marketplace. Um, that user has to go in and find the inventory that they want, identify it, go through all the parameters and select it. And so for Airbnb, what was really fascinating was we started to have a lot of inventory in these markets, which was great. But to actually improve the experience, we actually decreased the number of choices uh, in a specific geography to art artificially constrain the number of options because it became overwhelming because the cognitive load of searching through all permutations became too complex. We also provided filters to curate, uh, uh, to, to curate the type of listing you'd like. And we also developed taste profiles for the user to, to try to service, service those individuals uh, better with just implicit knowledge uh, that we had. On the homogeneous side, uh, it's great because uh, all, all these assets are roughly the same and the, ex the experience of, uh, of, of booking or transacting is, is much easier. Well, we're going to talk about that. But on the flip side, it's much easier to replicate. And a great example of that would be you know, the, the Uber and Lyft dichotomy, which, which exists to this day and has for, for many, many years now, and that the assets are roughly the same in terms of the experience. And many of the drivers, coincidentally, happen to be on both platforms as well. Uh, there's a huge benefit to a homogeneous marketplace in that it decreases the cognitive load on the demand side, creating a simpler transactional experience. And I call this really a matching marketplace where the transaction is really solved through algorithms. So it doesn't really matter if you got, you know, XYZ driver who's driving a Prius or, or um, ABC driver who's driving um, uh, a Ford Taurus. Uh, it, it, it really was kind of the same. It really is and was the same experience. But without these competitive modes that a heterogeneous and unique supply affords, homogeneous marketplaces compete in other aspects, commonly to compete on price. Uh, they can try to create some more forms of defensibility through brand, uh, which, which many of these businesses have tried to do, and also forms of supply loyalty, whether that be um, uh, financial incentives or allegiance or whatever it may be. And, and a handful of these marketplaces are still evolving around supply loyalty. I also wanted to talk about the supply growth X factor. Uh, I, got, I get the question all the time, which is, would I rather be supply constrained or demand constrained in a marketplace? And I use a really simple analogy to a, a brick and mortar store, which is a hairdresser. Would you rather have the best hairdressers in the world working at your store and nobody at your front door or no hairdressers at your store, but a, a, a line of customers out, out the door banging, banging to get in to get their haircut? I think you'd rather have the latter, which is uh, a tremendous amount of demand and being supply constrained. And I think just inherently with any business, that's the best place to be in. And so when people ask me that question, I always go back to that example. And then the next question people always ask is for Airbnb, were you demand or, or supply constrained? I would say it was both and it depended on a particular market and we pulled different levers to, to figure that out. But ultimately on the supply side, uh, many marketplaces start with these, this concept of underutilized assets, where they'll take leftover assets and put it on the platform. But what I've noticed and what really has made businesses like Airbnb and Uber really go is that those assets and or the time or labor of that individual becomes the highest and best use of that supply. And what I mean by that for a business like Airbnb, which is a more asset type business, people have now actually bought assets and put them on the platform. For Uber, um, the highest and best use of potentially people's labor could be they, they just, you know, were sitting at home potentially, and this is a way to actually monetize their time. Additionally, even with a car potential, that could be the highest and best use of that car. Uh, but I've seen many, many marketplaces where uh, those marketplaces use underutilized assets or underutilized labor, but ultimately the economics don't work for those participants and they'll ultimately fall away. So in whatever scenario you, you, you start with, you want to hopefully get those assets and or time slash labor to be the highest and best use of their time, at least for, for, for a period that makes economic sense for you um, as a business. 
Factor three is, is the classic uh, example of, of, of two-sided incentives. Uh, and for marketplaces to function and to keep functioning, both sides need to want to conduct commerce within the marketplace and not outside it. This avoids market breakage, which is people circumventing the platform by creating, as an umbrella, I've, I've, I've mentioned two terms here, trust and convenience. And I can't emphasize this market breakage enough because I've heard many stories around how people are going around the, uh, the platform, but, it's, it, but they'll be able to then eventually bring them back in. And that's not as easy as it looks because there may be strong reasons why people want to go around the platform. And we can talk about that. So on the trust and convenience side, uh, I've listed a handful of examples, but there are many, many more. Uh, I'll just roll through these really fast. On the identity verification side, who is this person and do I trust them? Uh, on the review side, have others stayed here, for instance, with Airbnb? Do they like it? What do other hosts have to say about this guest on, on the opposite side of the transaction? Uh, assurances around if something happens, can I call on somebody during my experience? Uh, for Airbnb, if my home is a mess, will I be covered for my losses? On the convenience side, uh, it's payments. Now, payments is becoming much more common, but believe it or not, when some of these marketplaces started, that was much more novel. Um, at, for instance, with Airbnb, as a host, will I get the money for, for the stay? Before Airbnb, that was a big question. If I send the money, can I be sure that the listing exists or it isn't fraud? On the messaging side, can I easily communicate and reach the other party? Uh, for transactions, did, the, did I buy the good or service? Did it reduce the burden of going back and forth multiple, multiple times? I want to mention that the key here, though, which is often ignored, is that both trust and convenience need to be established over multiple and different interactions. Conducting commerce with new participants all the time, you may want to call this a promiscuous user. It requires that the platform establish these incentives with each transaction strengthening the platform. A good counterexample to this potentially could be maybe a cleaning service marketplace, which is much more of a monogamous relationship. Or let's say you establish that relationship with a cleaning individual. And every week that same individual, in theory, could come to you because they're going to solve your need. It may make less sense for that individual then and you to stay on the platform because you've established trust through multiple interactions with the same individual. And so this promiscuity with multiple and different types of interactions really enables many, many marketplaces to thrive. So let's again just quickly dive into some examples that we've already talked about before. Airbnb, a traveler's destination is commonly very, very different than it was previously and people want to try new things. So it makes sense for that user to be pr uh, promiscuous. It's also hard for there to be repeat interactions because of the, this promiscuity. And also it's very, very hard to move money ac uh, across international um, boundaries. And so Airbnb providing that seamlessness, uh, even, uh, even on the convenience side was, was paramount. Uh, Uber, Uber and Lyft, just a, a couple of quick examples. It's easy to assume that trust could quickly be, be developed between both sides and that a passenger could just call up a favorite driver and pay them in cash. But calling a driver directly would inevitably take longer uh, than allowing the app to select any driver for you, creating a shorter wait time and a better experience. And so right there, again, trust and convenience uh, manifesting itself in different ways, but creating different reasons for people to stay on the platform. The fourth factor is the size and the frequency of the interaction. The size is, is just very simply the, the, the dollar value of the transaction. And large dollar transactions are roughly better for the platform because they generate more economic activity, big surprise. But normally the larger the transaction, the lower the take rate to disincentivize people from taking the transaction off the platform. Uh, you'll notice that when transactions get very, very large, take rates go much, much lower. Even for Airbnb, we've moderated our take rate for reservations that um, are um, smaller in dollar amount, reservations that are larger in dollar amount. When the incentive becomes so great to take the transaction off the platform to avoid fees, it becomes risky for uh, the marketplace, and they could potentially could get uh, intervened. Uh, they, they could potentially be intervened. On the frequency side, of course, it's better to have high frequency of interaction. It also is great to have high frequency of interaction because it changes the user's behavior and makes the product stickier. But again, kind of watch out for this repeat interaction between same parties because that's when people take the transaction offline. Really want to emphasize here that making sure the transaction volume is thriving is more important to a new marketplace than getting the largest take rate. Uh, for instance, I just invested in a marketplace where they started for many years and didn't have a take rate. And over time, they built that take rate in and have and grandfathered prior users 
but they took a long time to build the product, build the marketplace up, and then they layered on a take rate and it's been working. And so for them, it was much more important to, for them to have high transaction volume, AKA, AKA high GMV flowing through the platform with transactions being processed, but, but a minimal take rate. Here's just a chart of size and frequency of, of interaction um, uh, from, uh, from a variety of, of, of different startups in the ecosystem today. And, and big surprise, when you have high order, uh, order value, you have uh, lower, lower number of, of transactions. And when you have lower uh, uh, average order value, you have uh, a higher number of transactions. You know, open door is probably the, the pinnacle of this, where I think the average American may buy or sell a home roughly five or seven years. Uh, so that's a really low uh, frequency, but the order value is extremely high. And then open doors take rate is on a relative basis quite low, but the economics work because ultimately they, 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 get, they get a certain amount of money uh, for that transaction from a revenue perspective on the unit economics work. What I really wanna highlight here is when you think about CAC for marketplaces, you have to think about CAC for both the supply and the demand. It can get a little complicated with the accounting of that, but it is really important to think about that you not only need to get one side on the marketplace, but you need to get the other side on the marketplace too. And commonly you can, you, you can do the, the math around that by uh, figuring out which side of the marketplace is harder to get on, where are you spending more money and taking uh, the costs on the other side of the marketplace and attributing that back to one side, the opposite side of the marketplace. So you really understand your LTV to CAC equation and you're not deceiving yourself um, uh, going forward. It is always important to kind of get economics roughly right at the beginning, at least with an eye towards it working in the future. So these are really the four key factors that shape every marketplace. Uh, the, the type of network effect, the type of supply, these two-sided incentives, uh, and the size and the frequency of the, of the interaction. I do want to highlight that, not again, that not every problem or vertical should be solved with the marketplace. But if these four factors align, where network effects and all of these variables make the product experience better for the demand side, maybe a marketplace does make sense. And you can work really hard on building that liquidity and creating a thriving platform that will endure. Uh, so, so that's it with the, the presentation. Hopefully uh, it was useful. Uh, we will be happy to answer, uh, answer some questions going forward. And I'm gonna pull up uh, the... Um, question uh, website to see if anybody uh, has any uh, has any questions. Uh, here's a question uh, that just popped up. To be a marketplace in a lending business, how do you prove your credit worthiness to your suppliers, banks before you before your first lending deal? Let me think about that. To be a marketplace in lending business, how do you prove your credit worthiness to your suppliers before your first uh, lending deal? Well this, um, uh, well, this is an example of where the marketplace can potentially step in to provide the credit worthiness uh, of one side of the marketplace. Whenever there is a conflict between both the demand or the supply side of the marketplace, hopefully that platform can step in and bridge, bridge that gap. A great example of that was with Airbnb. Um, I, I built out the host guarantee program, which was uh, the guarantee program, which was backed by insurance. Uh, that when a home was um, harmed in any way, the Airbnb would be there to, pr to, to, to protect uh, the assets um, of that home. Uh, and people thought that we were crazy at the time for doing that back in 2011. Uh, but uh, it really, really worked. And if you actually look at the loss ratios, it, is, it came in below my and the company's estimates uh, and really, really hasn't materially moved up. And so that's when we really believed in the marketplace the participants being good and we took some risk around that and we thought that we could uh, take platform risk where we would uh, absolve any idiosyncratic risk and so um, you could potentially do that around the lending businesses as well. Another question here is what type of marketplaces are more likely to evolve in secondary markets i.e. StockX etc. So StockX is a great example of a marketplace evolving for a specific vertical. Uh, Goat is in that category as well as a handful of others. They really innovated around uh, two things. One was streamlining the product experience uh, in, in terms of narrowing in on a specific category and then doing more importantly, the verification process. 
Uh, and so they were, again, uh, able to create a strong incentives. Um, I would argue that's a combination of trust and convenience, where trust in that you verify that the good was there and, and convenience in that uh, it simplified uh, the, the, the transaction um, tremendously by, by realizing that they were authentic. Uh, another question here is, do you have a view on three-sided marketplaces? Any examples of successful models? I think three-sided three marketplaces ab absolutely work, of course. Uh, I think there's an additional level of di difficulty there. Uh, you know, you could, you could argue that DoorDash is potentially a three-sided marketplace with the, um, the uh, customer who's ordering the food, the restaurant, and the, the delivery uh, individual. Uh, they're not all inherently in conflict with each other. So the economics may work where it's more one side versus the other and two parties share kind of the economics on one side of the transaction. Uh, if three parties were inherently kind of opposing each other, I, I think that would really increase the level of, di of, of difficulty. Uh, let's see, what are the best practices on winning back unhappy early adopters who executed full, fully functional app services instead of a buggy? MVP. Uh, well, that's that's always hard. Uh, you know, I, I I do push all businesses to really get the product out there, get user feedback, and if you've lost some users, so be it. Hopefully, the future growth is going to be much much more important than anybody prior. Uh, and my advice would be look look for new new um, new supply and or new demand, and, and hopefully, if you can get it to a viable level, then then that supplier demand that tried you before will will eventually come back to you. Another question is, uh, do you have suggestions on how to fight breakage of marketplaces with monogamous relationships? Honestly, I think that that's really hard. Um, you know, you, I used the cleaning, cleaning service example as that. Um, uh, and uh, sometimes when there's a monogamous relationship, maybe you don't want to do a, a marketplace model. Maybe the right model to do is more of a traditional business where that person is employed. And so you... You maintain you, you take economics out of that transaction because the supply is is wedded to you from a contractual relationship versus being a marketplace. Are the rules of thumb as to who pays a take rate, buyer, seller, or both? Um, economically, if you if you look at the economics of it, no. In theory, no. That that that's behaviorally and psychologically, um, yes, it, it matters tremendously um, who the buyer or the seller. A, a lot of that is also structural. Um, you know, why, uh, what's happened in the past to the buyer seller, uh, which side of the marketplace paid it before was it embedded? Was it not? Um, normally when you can show them what they were paying before and lower it, that is better. Um, uh, versus kind of flipping it on, uh, on its head and, and applying it to somebody else. For instance, with Airbnb, a, as an example, you know, we, we, um, we have, uh, the take rate split between both sides and. And the host understood that a 3% take rate on the, on the host side was roughly for credit card processing fees. And that was a, a justifiable and reasonable fee on the host side. And, and so they understood that. So you, you have to think about the, the category you're in and the, and the behavior and psychology around it. Um, I'm not gonna be able to get to all these questions, but I'll try. Should marketplace, su should marketplace support or even replace supply side when there's a complaint from the buy side? How important is it in terms of getting credibility? Uh, this again kind of goes back to does the marketplace want to intervene slash platform intervene? I would say when it makes sense to it. Um, uh, you, get, you, you can't create moral hazard, um, but you know, it's more important for you to, for, for individuals to love your platform and our product and get thriving transaction volume slash GMV on the platform. And so if that means that you've kind of got to overprotect the marketplace in the early days, I, I, would, I would recommend that as long as you, you can afford it. I've got a minute left here. Maybe I'll answer one more question if I can. In the boating industry, marinas or harbors are not using any digital services. How would you onboard businesses for su supply which are against digitization? Uh, look, I think, I think categories and businesses you know, never turn over with digi digitalization until they finally do turn over. And you know, maybe, maybe now is the time. And, and you're seeing that with the restaurant industry because of uh, the uh, the COVID crisis. And so, you know, there, there's, uh, there is going to be a time when they, when they do digitize, uh, and it may be now, maybe in the future. Um, it's ju just a matter of the dynamics around why, why they would move over to new, to new technology. Um, so I think, I think I, uh, really don't have any more time here left. I've got, uh, maybe 20 seconds or so. So I'll, I'll end it here. Uh, thank you so much. 
And um, uh, uh, I'll try to find a way to distribute this presentation if I can uh, through the conference. Thank you.